Good evening, friends. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming this evening for uh, hopefully a very interesting uh, talk on a response to emerging infectious diseases in the context of urbanization and global warming. Where is the science gone? And uh, just to give the context to why we chose uh, this topic, and of course, uh, the top, we have a French speaker today. So I must uh, credit this to my colleague, uh, Dr. Adele, who was quite instrumental in suggesting this topic for this uh, very interesting uh, speaker that we will be introducing shortly. So on this, uh, today happens to be the Earth Day. And uh, what better way to celebrate uh, sustainable nature and environment than to have this topic and uh, we have with us, uh, uh, you know, we have this special emphasis uh, given by both uh, India and France uh, for doing uh, collaborative research, uh, which are also, uh, you know, for societal needs to understand how emerging infectious diseases spread in the urban context. So I'm pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Olivier Tell. Uh, to this monthly lecture series uh, of STIP Forum, where six of the organizations represented on the board here are or take turns to organize this lecture. And we have this very young researcher amongst us uh, who is, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce him to you. Uh, he's an urban geographer at uh, CNRS France. And he's currently leading the territorial, territorial dynamic acts of Centre de Sciences Humaines and is affiliated with Centre for Policy Research Delhi as well as a visiting fellow. His research is to better understand how global warming and socio uh, spatial dynamics of cities are connected to epidemic diffusion, especially focused on our own city, Delhi. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Olivier Tell. And uh, he will be shortly uh, you know, delineating his uh, research work in the context of urbanization and global warming. Uh, and uh, we have with us also a very eminent immunologist and uh, structural biologist, Dr. Dinakar Salunke who is the director for the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, popularly known as ICGB, New Delhi. Uh, I don't think we have enough time to uh, you know, count his uh, uh, you know, research, uh, uh, you know, all the things that he has been conferred with his awards and all that. But just to mention a few, I think I will mention that he is the recipient of the Shanti Sarub Bhatnagar Award for Science and Technology and is a fellow of almost all major academies in India. And uh, we, he, he, we will also be hearing from him. I think we will let him uh, moderate all the interactions uh, that follow the very interesting talk from Olivia. And uh, Sefipra is very happy to be associated with this lecture series. And thank you, all my colleagues from uh, the you know sister organizations who are you organizing this, Mr. Tandon, Ambassador Balakrishnan, uh, Dr. Vashne from the International Division, is head of the Bilateral International Division of Science and of DST, and uh, Dr. Adele from the French Embassy, the Deputy Science Counselor. Uh, from the French Embassy. So thank you, all of you, and ladies and gentlemen present here. Uh, we will give the floor now to Dr. Olivier. Uh, sorry, to Dr. Uh, Salunke for you know introducing himself and about the topic. Good evening to all of you, and th thank you, Dr. Rupal. Uh, it is a uh, great opportunity uh, for me to be part of this uh, lecture, particularly because I recollect uh, when I was vice president of Indian National Science Academy a couple of years ago, I 
was part of the discussions on integrating uh, International Union of Science and Social Science, and finally they merged uh, in 2016. So we really have a very appropriately a lecture that is at the interface between natural science and social sciences. It is quite clear now that you cannot demarcate, demarcate between natural sciences and social sciences because practically they actually overlap with each other they interfere with each other's uh, domains and if you study them together it actually would be lot more beneficial in fact pra practically most methodologies in both the sciences you can actually uh, see them to be uh, nearly similar there are similar ambiguities in interpretation there is similar level of quantitation and so on and so forth so in that sense this becomes very important uh, to hear out uh, uh, Dr. Olivier Tele uh, on the topic that he has chosen. Just as a uh, bit of an introduction from my side, uh, one thing I want to emphasize in the context that he is going to talk about is uh, we have in last uh, several years uh, recognized that uh, India as a country has been at the rear, uh, leadership role in terms of uh, production of uh, generic drugs. We are actually the global leaders. And thanks to our strength in uh, synthetic organic chemistry over a long period of time. And uh, similarly, uh, we have been now a major vaccine manufacturer and supplier for all over the world. and our. Uh, mm, biotech industry has proven capable of producing uh, macromolecular entities which are used as vaccine in as high a quality that is required for making vaccine using good manufacturing practices. So we, if you look at it in health sector, both drugs and vaccines which are actually most important requirements in terms of handling infectious diseases, we are on the top. But at the same time, one realizes, and it is recognized, that there is a huge wave of drug resistance in all aspects of infectious diseases. Also, you do encounter immune escape in terms of use of vaccines. So we have not been able to make vaccine for HIV or influenza for those reasons. So there is a dichotomy here in the sense we cannot actually sit and think that we have solved the problems. We are the reader, uh, leaders. We can manufacture drugs and vaccines. And we should be able to get over this problem. because. There is a problem, just like we humans are very intelligent in trying to find solutions, these pathogens are equally intelligent in terms of evading this problem. And overcoming this may it be uh, uh, drug resistance or immune escape. And that battle makes us actually keep working all the time in terms of trying to discover new drugs, trying to discover new vaccines, and that battle goes on. Uh, uh, as uh, like a merry-go-round uh, searching for each other. And that is not enough. Now we do see there are factors that are coming in and those two factors are what we are going to discuss and learn more about is urbanization. We can see in uh, the fantastic thing is the governance has not been at fault in the sense this is recognized. There are a lot of things are being tried to find solutions to the problems of mainly public health. We are trying to resolve this issue not only in terms of making new drugs and vaccines, but also handling our uh, uh, public health problems in terms of clean water or uh, in terms of cleanliness and so on and so forth. But the factor that is what we are going to hear for next uh, 45 minutes or so urbanization where large number of peoples are 
leaving villages and coming to cities particularly delhi is a very good example a fantastic nice colony everything is organized very well but on the edge of it across the wall you have a large base of people who have just migrated they have no sanitation and everything becomes messy and handling that in terms of management is not a easy thing and this is not true only with delhi but it is practically all urban bases wherever you develop a new smart city there will be actually areas where people will come hoping to get job and things like that and management of that even for a efficient government to model that in terms of how to solve problems is not going to be easy and all those issues do affect i mean like for example the dengue wave or uh, new viruses that are coming uh, which becomes a consequence of this third factor that gets added to this is climate change the temperature changes make life longer for viruses sometimes because the temperature rise will make the difference so this complexity is bring in all the uh, geographical sociological factors and management factors to be taken into account when you are trying to solve problem of host pathogen interaction in terms of handling pathogens affecting our health so it natural and seamless that is to be followed in terms of winning this battle to take care of all the factors together and i hope uh, the discussion that follows after the lecture and the core of the lecture itself will actually take us in that direction in terms of this beautiful topic uh, for integration of social sciences and natural sciences to address our health issues and uh, uh i invite uh, uh, dr olivier telly to deliver his lecture mm. this evening thank you okay uh, thank you dr rupal and thank you dr salunke for your very kind introduction Um, so indeed, uh, my name is Olivier Tell. So I am researcher at CNRS. I started working in India uh, 12 years back when I started my MPhil in India. I wanted first of all to work on, you know, the relation between water access and um, classical disease such as cholera, etc. But when I reached India in 2006, uh, Delhi was facing one of the first, most important dengue epidemics, and the journals were locating this epidemic in South Delhi. which for me as a geographer would not make sense so i will explain you that later so i find interesting that okay uh, everyone has studied before uh, the geography of classical disease such as malaria um, or cholera etc plagues within city but no one really studied the geography of emerging disease cause dengue is what we call emerging disease which mean it was not very much present here 30 years back and now all major cities situated in the intertropical belt are affected So I decided actually to uh, to entitle my talk Response to Emerging Infectious Disease Where is the Science Gone to kind of summary 12 years of experience it's quite short but I think it was interesting for me to try to summary uh, everything I've been through so I indeed I'm a social scientist I worked as well at Institut Pasteur Paris so in Institute of Biology and Immunology so I can say that it was hard for three years for me to learn new concepts, but it was very useful, and I hope this talk can summarize this and can show the interest of mixing science together. So let's start. So I'm a health geographer. That means traditionally, health geographer will try to locate epidemic of infectious disease within cities. It's not something which is new. Uh, I put here the John Snow map, which is very well known. This is a doctor actually who had the the ID to plot cholera cases during uh, the 80 uh, 54 cholera epidemic in London. And by doing that you can see on the left small dots here which represent the numbers of cholera cases being registered in a house. And he could find actually that all these cases were located next to water pumps. Which mean that most probably the infectious was taking place in this area and by removing the handle of these water pumps it could actually uh, stop cholera from spreading without even knowing what was the cause of cholera 
So since then, health geographers uh, tried to locate epidemic within cities and took actually the disease as a revealer of social and spatial disparities. So I started to study dengue in 2006 because, as I say, no one really studied the uh, geography of an emerging diseases. Why? Because the link between social spatial disparities and incidence of these cl classical diseases were always very intimate. To make it short, we could find cholera uh, cases in uh, the most deprived population of cities. So health geography started to shift from epidemic uh, study to, let's say, uh, access to health uh, studies. So dengue emerged, as I said, during the 70s in Asia. This is what we call an emerging diseases. So it has four serotypes. This is very important, which means that, uh, for example, I got affected by serotype 2 in 2013 in Delhi, uh, which means I am immu immune to this serotype, but I can be affected by the three other ones. Uh, you all know the mosquitoes that transmit this, uh, this virus. This is our Aedes uh, species. So we have on the right the Aedes aegypti and then on the left the Aedes albopictus. So Aedes aegypti is very well suited for urban environments. Why? Because it needs some clear water to spread, unlike malaria. That means it will spread most of the time in a small water quantities, like people with store water at home, and it's a perfect breeding site for the Aedes to spread. So indeed, you were mentioning that uh, the world is facing uh, more and more emerging diseases, such as dengue, but dengue is not the only one. We are as well facing epidemic of Ebola, em epidemics of chikungunya, epidemic of Zika. Uh, lots of infectious diseases are rising. With this is quite surprising, because during the 60s, WHO that thought that uh, infectious diseases were controlled. And we can see that it's not the case. All, all over the world, we have many examples of this. So this is due indeed to the overuse of antibiotic or viruses. You're right, viruses are smart. They're going to change actually, to spread in population. And as well urbanization. As I say, uh, Aedes aegypti is the urban mosquitoes, so the global emergence of dinghy is reflecting clearly urbanization of the world. We have now something around 400 million infections all over the world. In India, of course, but as well in Brazil. Um, we had recent epidemic in northern Italy, and we have, since uh, two years now, Aedes mosquitoes in Paris itself. So there is clearly a convergence of urban areas, um, let's say, destiny. And uh, we should prepare right now uh, to face epidemic of dengue, of Zika, etc. in Europe. It's clearly a next disease, a next uh, sorry, area where this uh, virus will spread. So uh, I will kind of summarize now the research I did. So I reached uh, India in 2006, and um, I wanted to study the geography of these diseases. So the first aim, actually, was really to get access to the surveillance system in place in Delhi. So I worked closely with the municipality of Delhi, who was actually setting a very interesting surveillance system. They have settled 38 sentinel hospitals that register um, dengue cases every day. This is quite huge in comparison to other cities uh, like Mumbai have only three sentinel hospitals. In Thailand, they register as well all the type of cases, so it's a different way, but the surveillance system in Delhi is pretty well settled. That means they will register only confirmed cases, so we are sure that the dengue cases uh, emerging in the surveillance system are really uh, dinghy cases. So I plotted individual being affected in Delhi uh, at the address of residency. You cannot see here clearly, but I had to plot the, the location place of people, individual, uh, for three years, 2008, 2009, 2010. This was quite a work. It took me uh, four months only to realize such a map. So yeah, for four months I was just putting dots on the map, but it's uh, really the core of my research. And then I was studying the way the disease was spreading inside city and in relation with socio-economical factors. This is the map of uh, the PhD I conducted. Uh, so actually what you are doing here, you are mapping the density of cases over three years, 2008, 2009, 2010. As I say, for 2008, 9, and 10. And we have several inf interesting information here. So we have only, for example, 1,200 cases in 2008, 2009. So we could think that the disease is stable. But while realizing, uh, mapping these cases, we can see it's not the case. We have the same numbers of cases, but the geography is completely different. South Delhi was not affected in 2008, while it is clearly a hotspot in 2009. West Delhi was affected in 2008, what reversely, it was not hotspot in 2009 and 2010. This is 
a very important information for geographers like me. It is clearly a new model of spread for diseases. Naturally, um, epidemics were stable in time. That means the area being affected one year, where most probably the area affected the years after. Here we can see that over a year, the geography is changing very fast, which means that it's very difficult for the, for the municipalities to predict the next epidemic according to the past one. We can see as well that the relation with socio-economic environment is clearly not defined. South Delhi is uh, where the, let's say, the well-developed area are located, and we have actually uh, high numbers of dinghy cases uh, in 2009 and 2010. This is the second important change. This is a new model of uh, health geography that we could uh, discover uh, in Delhi, actually. So this is done by surveillance system. And in 2013, we got an uh, INR project funded by French, and we work uh, with uh, ICMR, Indian uh, Center for Medical Research, to uh, go on field and test population for past antibodies and recent antibodies. So we went in 18 colonies of Delhi. We tested 2,100 individuals in 18 colonies of Delhi, according to several uh, socioeconomic categories. So you can see we went in Mohammadpur, to JVR, going through Rajori Nagar, etc. And we tested them with rapid diagnosis tests to understand if they were presenting some recent antibodies. That means someone, it will tell us that someone has been infected one month before, or if they presented IgG antibodies, which means the individual was at infected at least once in his life. And this is the result we have on the right. I don't know if it's clearly uh, the case. So NIMR, National Institute of Malaria Research, conducted as well some uh, vectorial indexes. That means they did tremendous amount of work to visit 10,000 houses over a 12 month period in 2013. And they could detect actually that IADS Aegypti was much more present in the uh, impoverished high density area in comparison with the, uh, let's say, richer area, the well-planned area. We have, for example, 10% of the houses which presented IADS larvae in impoverished high density, while we have only 4% of houses controlled positive for IADS Aegypti the same years. So we could think that the geography of the disease, uh, the incidence rate will follow the same pattern, but it's not the case. You can see here the percentage of population uh, that was, that presented past antibodies of dinghy, and it's around 40%, if I'm not wrong, yeah. 40% of the population residing in this impoverished high density wa were affected at least once in their life. And in rich area, in a well-planned area, we are around uh, 30%, 35%. So it's kind of confirmed what we could see through the surveillance system. There is clearly no link between social um, disparities, social spatial disparities, and the uh, infection rates of dinghy. This is very interesting as well, this, these things. Uh, just to tell you, actually, we could find that 40% of people were actually uh, confirmed positive for, for dinghy in Delhi, which is not a lot, actually. Uh, in Bangkok, it's something like 90% of people. So that means there is more space for dinghy in Delhi in the, in the coming years. And clearly, actually, we say that Delhi is the capital of dinghy. Actually, no, Delhi is the capital of dinghy because the surveillance system is very well planned here. So uh, after my PhD and my postdoc, I started to work in, uh, in, uh, sorry, in uh, Bangkok, and I'm currently working on the uh, project in Laos funded by uh, Agence Française de Développement to, to confirm what we could see uh, in Delhi. And we could see actually exactly the same phenomenon. The geography of the disease was changing very fast between epidemics, and there were clearly no relation between socioeconomical environments and the incidence rate of dinghy. You can see here, this is in Vientiane, Laos. This is 2013, 2014, 2015. And we can see as well that the clusters are very different from one year to the other one, which confirm what we could observe actually in, uh, in Delhi. So it is not only related for, for dinghy. We could see as well, we thought that Ebola will only spread in the forest area of, of, uh, of Africa, but it's not the case actually. Now it started to spread in cities, even in environment where we thought it would not spread. So this is common to all the emerging diseases we can see worldwide. The question at this time was why? Why don't we have um, a strong link, important link, the classical link that we detected in geography between incidence rates and environments and um, the amount of mosquitoes we can find in the environments? Actually, it's because people are moving within city. 
Uh, you know that cities are changing, and the land use change is not the only uh, phenomenon happening in these cities. As you said before, more and more people are coming in cities. For example, in South Delhi, we have a lot of people moving here, and it's a central places. We could find less mosquitoes there everywhere else, but because people are going to work here every day, they bring the virus with them. In, in this case, as well, reversely, people from well-developed area will travel internationally and we spread the disease with them. In Delhi, we could see, for example, that 80% of population of people affected by dengue were asymptomatic. This is an important factor that help to spread the virus. That means I get dengue, I'm not healed, I'm not sick, I will continue to travel everywhere, internationally, nationally, regionally, uh, within cities, and I will spread the virus with me. So that's a great challenge for us geographer, because we have important data on socio-economical environment, of build-up, on weather, and I will come back on that, but it's very difficult to understand how people move within city, and it's a clear challenge for geographer like me, and that's where virology helps us, actually. So this is a philogeography of um, dinghy strains. Uh, do not hesitate to, to ask me to go slowly if it's, if it's a bit difficult, because I work on that since 10 years, so <laughs> sorry for that. So this is actually the strains that has been detected in South America. I did not do this study. This has been done by Montigny and all. And you can see here, by sequencing the virus, they can actually estimate the diffusion route of this virus within the city. You can see here in blue, uh, where is this thing? So all the cases being detected in the central places of San Jose are found in the suburbs here. So we know that the infected population here share exactly the same strain than the one being detected here, detected in the central area. So it helps us actually, we are not estimating um, the mobility pattern of population to estimate the virus diffusion of, uh, of, uh, in, in the population. We are precisely doing the inverse. We are looking at the viral dispersal of uh, the virus within city and then we can reconst reconstruct all the mobility of people. We know that these people, for example, on the suburbs were uh, at some point going in the central places and were infected here. This is exactly the same for here. We know that this, this uh, actually strain were not giving, given other sources on infection. These cases did not spread. So it's very useful for us because we can really reconstruct the phylogeography of the, of the dinghy uh, strains. So we are trying now to get access to this mobility uh, data, but it's very difficult. We have some mobility pattern uh, at national level, we have very few of them within city and between cities. So we have some tools that can help us, like mobile phone data, etc., which are uh, very much used in private sectors, but not used yet for public health. This is clearly the next challenge for public health. We need to integrate this data to better plan where to act and when to act to control diseases. So this is, for example, some uh, population movement. We uh, got access through Facebook in Peru after floodings, and we can actually follow people after disasters. We know that these people here were actually going to Iquitos. We could think that they will go next by. No, that's not true. They were traveling on a high distance. So this being done for post-disaster management, but we have to use that on a more routine way to uh, understand how virus diffusion and how movement of population are linked or not even. This is as well what has been done by calling of mine in uh, Guwahati after uh, the floodings. So you cannot see clearly here, but what we can see that lots of population moved from the river bank to the high hill area. So it can help us as well to better, not only to control better the viruses, but as well to a better you know, target where we should help people. I will go fast. So the second step, or even third step was really, I'm a, fundamental research. That's me normally I'm not supposed to act on field. But when you are working on health, I think it's not fair. And we really have to help the population. So we are currently working with the municipality of Delhi. We are putting this trap in uh, three, four colonies. Uh, not me, actually. The municipality of Delhi is putting this trap themselves. They have a quite good manpower who are handling with this, this trap. They are working in collaboration with an IMR. And we are only providing the trap. This is very simple trap. There is no chemical inside. So we just put grass here and with water, and the grass will actually produce some dioxygen that will attract the female mosquitoes because she will want to lay the eggs in this water. So they are doing that, and this is some results. You can see, for example, this is we put a stick so as the, the female mosquitoes got stick on it. 
and uh, this is very interesting because it gives us information uh, on the numbers of mosquitoes, adult mosquitoes we have in environment, but we can as well test these mosquitoes for pathogens. So NIMR tested this, uh, these mosquitoes, and they could find actually that dinghy was transmitted even in uh, January in Delhi. So it was very interesting for them to, uh, to collect this, uh, this mosquito. This is very simple tool that uh, we can use uh, on everyday basis. I'm not really sure it will control mosquitoes, but it gives us a, a signal that, okay, dinghy is here, or Zika is here, you can detect dinghy, but you can detect as well other pathogens. Because, yeah, the, the fourth step is really, as I say, to locate better where we will implement this trap. We cannot cover Delhi with all this trap. It's not possible, because this trap has to be put every 50 meters to be efficient. And in the cities like Rio, in cities like Delhi, it's not possible to cover 22 million inhabitant cities. We cannot put a trap FD every 50 meters. So as I say, we first of all trying to understand how people will move during an epidemic. And many researchers are trying to do that, and it's very interesting in my opinion. Still. I think we should go back to the whole history of geography. We have to find when and where social economical disparities matters. Uh, we cannot control people's movement, it's not possible. So uh, environment and social disparities is clearly the only option we have to uh, reduce uh, the, the viral um, spread. We could find actually this is when uh, climate change is uh, coming into the picture. This is work done by Rupalipal, she's an engineer uh, recruited at CSH, and she's estimating the surface temperature within Delhi. And uh, actually we had quite a striking, a very surprising uh, fact is that we have a 10 degrees temperature between the high density area of Delhi and uh, let's say the South Delhi on the places next to the, to the forests. And uh, we could say, okay, it's too complex to to understand, but it can, of course, I don't think it matters a lot during epidemics, but I think it matters a lot during pre-epidemic or during winters. Why? Because actually in this area, it's uh, globally by night, it's seven degrees in Delhi. Let's say this is a global temperature in January, but we could find that it's much warmer in this deprived high density area than the other one. It's around 15 degrees at night. And then IMR could actually, uh, weigh it. actually this is what we done in Vientiane as well, we could find the same way, we have 10 degrees temperature. This is a classical model right now that we can detect in Paris as well, it's not only in Vientiane or Delhi, etc. And then IMR could actually detect uh, some mosquitoes, this is a mosquitoes, the percentage of houses being control positive um, during 12 months in I. Uh, density area versus the lower uh, density area and we could find that in the well-developed area we had no mosquitoes during December and January. It was 0% of houses were controlled positive for, for IADS. Why? We still have some mosquitoes in the warmer area of Delhi. This is very important. Rather than trying to control the epidemics when it happened, when it emerged, I think it's too late. In my opinion, we should focus our effort in this moments of the years, trying to, con because if you have mosquitoes, you might find the virus diffusion in these hotspots. So it's just a theory right now. So we are trying to catch the mosquitoes in January with a trap to confirm this hypothesis that indeed we have a virus in the mosquitoes in the months of January and February. Okay, um, I think I we should go fast. So I showed you, right, we are currently doing in several areas. Right now I'm trying to, let's say, systematize the the work I'm currently doing on urbanization, on uh, uh, let's say climate study, mobility models and all into the pattern. We have to systemize these things to compare dinghy uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Delhi, dinghy, the upcoming epidemic of dinghy in Paris that will come sooner or later, and in Vietnam. This is how we work actually with several partners in India, and IMR as I say, but as well Center for Policy Research. So we are gathering several information, land cover, meteorology, demography, socio-economic, socio-economy, and fund social networks. So we are putting that into a GIS and we are studying the way they are evolving um, according to each other. We could see before that climate was highly related to density. This is an information we never had before. And then we are putting all this surveillance data into it, which enable us to to really understand how it works, how dinghy is related to climate change, to urbanization and to mobility uh, pattern within city, in Delhi, but not only, in Laos, etc. because we want to find some structural factors. We want to say, okay, this matters, this matters as well, but much less, etc. So we need to study all these diseases in the same way, using the same methodology. This is clearly the next step. And we want as well to create some simulation using gamma, that means 
trying to simulate the complexity of the epidemic to find uh, when socio-economical disparities matters. So this is our approach right now in Delhi, in Laos, in Bangkok, in France as well. And uh, I quite like this project because it uh, involved lots of Indian researchers and lots of French researchers as well. We, um, for example, um, created a school, Delhi Art School in Genu, two weeks back to learn, to teach students how to manipulate all this data together. It's not easy because uh, we are approaching big data. You know, we have data on climate, we have data on mobility, and uh, for example, for Facebook da users, we have more than one million users in Delhi of, uh, of Facebook. If we want to understand how it moves, uh, that's, that's quite tricky to handle. So we are trying to realize such a school, methodological school, to really teach uh, students how to, to manipulate this data. This is as well some open source data. I really insist on that. More and more data are open source to study uh, environment change and urbanization uh, at the world level. This is uh, European projects actually that provide free data, open source data on urbanization, and this is quite useful. This is, uh, uh, for example, I showed you some few examples here. Uh, this is, for example, the bit up density in uh, in Vientiane in 1990. This is the percentage of the grid that was filled with built up. So you can see in dark blue, that's where we have let's say the high density, uh, high build up density, and in, in white where we have le much less. So this is the year 1990, this is the year 2000, so we can see that we have a growth, and 2014. So as a geographer before, we needed to create this data. This data is right now open source data, so I really encourage everyone to use this, this kind of information. This is very useful to compare urbanization all over the world. The data is freely available for this three dates for all over the world and from even 1975 which I did not include. So this is Delhi here. We have the same data. So, uh, this is 1990, this is 2000, this is 2015. So you can see here the emergence of, of Gauguin and uh, it's quite useful this data to really understand how cities evolve in time and space altogether. And I think as well that India has tremendous uh, data on census data. We are trying right now to include all the census data at village level CPR is trying to create this uh, CPR and CSH are trying to create this open source data that will gather all this data about uh, census of India at village level, but as well build up. And we uh, would like to provide this data, of course, freely and to teach students how to use that. So what next to summarize? What next in uh, in health uh, study? So I think for many years, geographers were actually more interested in fundamental research. Uh, than anything else. So I remember that 10 years back we were providing some, okay, you should control the disease like this or like that, but they, it was completely disconnected from the capacities to, to deal with, uh, with this, uh, with this uh, environmental changes. As I said, we cannot cover uh, Delhi with the mosquito trap. It's not possible. So we have to work hand by hand with the people in charge, with the administration in charge of disease control. In fundamental research, this is not something we have been doing for many years. I think it's a big change right now that we should do more and more. And integrating mobility of population is clearly a major change that uh, even uh, the paradigmatic change that would help us and should help us in better controlling uh, infectious diseases. The third one is really trying to connect all these data together. This is not very easy, but by providing open source data, we can, in my opinion, link urbanization, climate change, and uh, virus spread in India and, and, and as, well, as well. So I think that's it. I, I leave some time for the discussion. Thank you uh, very much for your attention. So, thank you, Olivier, for this uh, 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 remarkable illustration of looking at health issues at the interface of uh, uh, geographical analysis and actual scientific methodologies. It is true interface, and he's as much a scientist, I would say, as <coughs> those of us practicing in institutions of infectious diseases added to that the analysis of migrations of people and related issues really provides interesting models and it is these models that would help the people who are managing health problems to actually resolve them better and as we go along as we use big data methodologies uh, in, in more and more 
hopefully these models will work something like health uh, uh, sorry the weather forecasting patterns 40 years back our health forecasts used to be practically wrong uh, uh, today they are almost uh, so very accurate those models probably would have been made by methodologies something like this so today if we have this uh, data analysis and we do actually one of the other important source of the epidemic analysis is what we have national survey data available with the health ministry for over 30 40 years in some cases and analysis of those data some of my colleagues have done provides interesting patterns of how the disease centers migrated and uh, even within uh, within delhi how the epidemic grew in south delhi from where it was not there is really interesting to analyze and only geographists can actually be able to analyze it so uh, without uh, too much of my talking i think uh, we should keep the floor open and uh, you have a question This talk very very useful and informative, and uh, you have mentioned in detail the emerging infectious diseases in context of urbanization. Urbanization at what cost? <coughs> it is at the cost of deforestation, and the, the barrier disease host barrier has been broken because of this dis deforestation. Sorry, let me introduce first myself. I am Dr. Nil Kumar Sharma. I am a veterinary professional presently working as a joint director in the department of animal husbandry, UP government. Deforestation, it, the forestry, for forestry it should be 33% of land. It is around 21%. Where the wildlife go? It is wildlife, the infections which were, uh, I mean, they are confined to the wildlife, they are now in human being also because of closeness, proximity of wildlife as well as human being. This is a genetic problem. Uh, not, uh, this genetic problem, not from wildlife to human being, but domestic animal to human being. And it is due to the urbanization. If animal, man-animal conflict, conflict, habit of wild animal as a man-eater, various so, uh, uh, epidemic so issues. Actually, there is no dispute Focus on, Focus on, on the same topic of that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the, not only dengue, but it is a specific disease calendar: chikungunya, swine flu. I come, uh, this is a disease calendar in Delhi itself in the month of September. Again, we when we we move to October, it will be a stable burning again a environmental problem, respiratory diseases. Every time these are a disease calendar all the times and not a single day in Delhi, it was a normal uh, for point of air quality index. Every time it is um, uh, uh, poor, very poor, dangerous, this is a, again a point of concern and infectious diseases of such nature which was not prevalent are increasing. Avian influenza, again from uh, poultry to human being, this is all due to the uh, poor sanitation, unhygienic condition, garbage collection in the cities due to heavy urbanization. This point is very well prevalent and diseases are day by day increasing which are of infectious or contagious nature. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, deforestation, you're right. You know, we uh, often say that Ebola has been uh, linked actually with uh, this deforestation because it, uh, it increased the contact between animals and uh, population, human population. For dinghy, that's less true, of course, because it's not related to, to forests, but yeah, you, yeah, it should be studied more carefully. Yeah, please. Thank you, sir, for the comprehensive presentation. I have two small issues to be raised. The first issue is disease surveillance program in India, the level of disease surveillance program in India. As we witnessed in Kerala, there were Nipah virus uh, uh, infection and it was well managed 
what happening is Delhi, the people are harboring virus and coming from the outside. So we don't have the same level of DG surveillance system all over the India, just like we have Kerala. Delhi has a good DG surveillance system. Number two point. In Delhi, we live in a neighborhood, crowded population. We don't have people to people interaction that uh, we have in our villages or towns. Now what happened? The uh, AD's uh, mosquito can travel 100 meter. I can cl clean my dessert cooler, but what about the neighbor? This uh, point. Thank you. Yeah, for the last question, you're right. Uh, you can consider that you can be impacted by someone else's risk factors because he's not doing what he's doing. Reversely, you can think as well by protecting your environment, you protect someone else's environment. So you can see other bad aspects, but we should think it as an opportunity, as a collective things, okay? That's not everyone has to clean in his environment. If we reach a threshold, that might help everyone to uh, all together. So, yeah, I often mention the Paris case. You know, the Paris was very dirty at this time. It was the most uh, dirtiest cities in uh, Europe, actually. They were witness this cholera epidemics, but it's, this cholera epidemic helped in uh, improving sanitation. Why? Because the richer population understood that actually to prevent themselves from being infected, they have to help the poor to get access to sanitation. So I think sanitation is a great deal as well, but of course diseases are risky, it's very dangerous, but we can see them as well as a good opportunity to change uh, cities, that it was done in Europe and elsewhere. But we are losing that as well in Paris. We are thinking more on individual behavior, while it's more indeed a collective one, we should think this thing. The, in Delhi, what has helped to sort out this problem of two neighbors not talking to each other is resident welfare associations. And they work at several levels. And actually, government of Delhi and municipal corporations work through them. So it's the resident welfare association members who talk to each other and get it done. I live in Vasant Kunj and I've realized at three different levels, there is an effective monitoring of these matters. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. uh, good evening. My, working? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Abha Jaiswal, and I am a visiting fellow at uh, RIS. Uh, my question to you is, are you looking at any other diseases besides dengue uh, for the same kind of uh, study? And. Uh, uh, since you have uh, information on migrants, do you also looking at which migrants are more predisposed to spreading the, the, the virus or, or, or spreading the disease? Okay, so uh, what is interesting in deng the dengue, I mean, yeah, that's terrible, but it affects city every, every year. So we are trying to study other diseases when they come. Chikungunya, for example, is coming, but it's living straight away. So it affects, for example, Delhi in 2013, if I'm not, not, not wrong, and then it goes. So we are studying them when they come. So we study the geography of, uh, of Chikungunya when it comes in Delhi, and we could see the same pattern, actually. The, you know, the geography of the disease was not what we could expect, actually. For the second question, it was about, I forgot, sorry. Yeah, migrants, yeah, yeah, migration. More than migrants, I will really talk about migration or even commuting because then we say that it's always a migrant that brings the disease. We should be very careful. That's not what is happening. Me, myself, I migrate in the city a lot. You know, I travel a lot because I can afford Uber. I can afford long distance travel. I travel to Paris. I might be actually the one spreading the disease as a researcher when I go to Laos. You know, I'm infected. So this is, we have to be careful on this thing. Let's say commuters because otherwise there's a bad things. So right now it's very difficult to link because most of the people are symptomatic. As I say, we don't get access to this data. We're trying to get access to this data. So we have mobile phone data that will be very useful for us. We did not succeed till now. So it's always in discussion because this data is, is well very tricky. You know, there is a, you have to, to preserve, you know, the people privacy. So we don't know at what scale we need to aggregate it. It's difficult to talk with people about this because, and it's equally difficult to, to get access to this data, but I think it should be carefully used, but it will give us a lot of information about where to act, for example. Right now we are thinking of acting in places where people live, but if we can leave, you know, act, put this trap in central area, 
like market, school, etc. And uh, so this data would be very useful for us. Thank you, Olivia, for the wonderful talk. Uh, observation or question. Uh, you said uh, that viruses, all these viruses, whether it's Zika, or Chikungunya, or Dengue, the viruses are getting uh, smarter. So my added emphasis to that is that adaptive learning from the changing climate conditions are making the viruses smarter. So vis-a-vis -vis when you're talking about big data and machines and algorithms, so how do you see the dynamics of the natural algorithm of viruses competing with the human-made algorithms of machine learning? So how do you see the dynamics of that? Oh, That's yeah. a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh. <laughs> no, yeah. So you're right. Yeah, I, I say that viruses were smarter. So actually, they are not. It's it's natural selection. What what is happening? You know, for example. We know that uh, viruses emerge because we use more and more antibiotics. So you know when you are creating a space, you are emptying a space, this space has to be filled. So that's when the virus came, like HIV. HIV. We know that HIV exists since, since many, many years, more than we thought. It emerged, actually, because we overuse antibacteria things, and it created this space. So this is a complexity within the virus families and as well with our own, own environments with urbanization. So all this is difficult to model. So we have to model the virus one versus the population one and put them together. This is very tricky. So that's why actually I started with stru structuralism theory, you know, taking the disease as revealers of disparities. I needed to change my paradigm to complexity theories, integrating the virus changing the population one and modeling all together with the weather one. Honestly, in my opinion, I, I try to create what we call the simulation, the multi-agent uh, multi simulation on computer ones. It's not working. It's not working because the complexity teaches us that a small change, a butterfly effect, you put a small change in your model, it will create a huge disparities with the reality. However, this model is very useful for us to try to reproduce the reality. That teaches us these precise butterfly effects. For example, I did a small model, putting the mosquito in it, the virus one, and the population one in it, and you could see that by just decreasing the amount of uh, mosquitoes in the model by 10%, you could decrease the epidemics. So I think all these simulations are interesting for us to capture this complexity, to model this, otherwise we have no other way, actually. So pre actually what I do is that I'm not trying to forecast epidemic. I'm just trying to hope you do the reality which is hard enough, because the pathways are many. What we saw here, the geography of, the, of dinghy, is one pass amongst thousands, what we could observe. So this is a challenge for us, not to predict the epidemic, but to predict what happened right now, and on what option we could have played for the virus to spread less. So I don't know if I answer your question, because this is not really my field, <laughs> you know, all these machine learnings and all. I just said that, yeah, it can provide interesting information, but uh, I'm still looking at them, yeah. No, I can only add to that on, in a lighter way. Uh, you are, when in your hypothesis, you are ignoring the intelligence of the human host. <laughs> You're only uh, putting uh, artificial intelligence, algorithms of big data against the insect. What about us? So we are on the superior side. <laughs> Thank you. Just be on the other side. There is a constant <laughs> bar between human being and the mosquitoes. <laughs> and we have been trying several repellent. For example, when I was a child, we were spraying DDT. Mm -hmm. But within no time, uh, mosquito won that, over mm. that. <laughs> <laughs> then we came with different repellent like uh, mosquito coils or uh, uh, that vibration based uh, repellents. And uh, we are using stickers different kind of repellent we have tried, but within one or two cycles, mosquitoes have one over that. So their immunity level increases. So what I feel is that if we bring in any artificial things, so I, I don't agree with you, our <laughs> intelligence is increasing, our host intelligence is increasing, but uh, if you see, we are co continuously vulnerable group of species and uh, these chemicals or solutions are only temporary in the period of time. 
I, I, I agree with you. I at the outset I said that in the beginning <coughs> that we cannot sit thinking that we have solved the we have solved the problem. The problems will keep coming, and we have to keep looking for newer answers. I I have no dispute on that. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, please. I must uh, appreciate the institutions for bringing us together. My name is Narendra Gupta, ex ISRO. Fortunate to have worked as a stenographer to Dr. APJ, 73 to 77. Straight to the question, uh, I was a part of the NCT urbanization plan way back in 1986 as a student. And this question was raised about the uh, the uh, infectious disease control by uh, one Mr. P. K. Sen, who was a civil engineer and uh, other professionals. Uh, you know, with the NCT plan, when it was extended right from Delhi to Alba, on this side, this side to Panipat, and again this side to Loni and beyond, and uh, Saibabad and whatnot. Now, the, I will take a specific case of Ashok Vihar. Uh, we have 280 uh, dwelling houses. They were single story once upon a time. Now, out of that, only 34 are left, single story. And now, all other buildings, dwelling houses, are four story or five story, four and a half story. I had the fortune of inviting Dr. Uh, Najib Jing, uh, Jang Sahab, uh, LG, in April 2013 to our colony, and my spouse was interviewed by the team of the press and all. Now the urbanization, the area was only meant for single dwelling houses. Now with the growing urbanization, the diseases have also come because of the construction workers on all the dwelling plots. They do the curing in the morning. Again, their children, you know, how do we see them? They, they defecate in the open, I'm not joking. Government may claim anything. There is a CD park in the morning between 4.30 to 6 o'clock. We, we see them and we hurl them out. Now, the government has literally failed to control in their duty, one. Second, I would appeal to the government to make aware the construction workers, contractors, owners of the houses to uh, you know, put a stop on the infectious diseases being carried out by their children and you know others for the benefit of the other dwellers also. Now my uh, point again, I was uh, you know uh, listen to Dr. Pandya of uh, SPA School Planning and Architecture and Dr. Rao also. I have deep interest. I have spent around 22 years in the infrastructure company. After no, I'm not. coming to the question that the awareness has to be there. Uh, from the lowest term. How, uh, you know, would you agree on that? Or whose responsibility is that? RWA doesn't do anything. I have to differ with you very strongly. I'm the president of the, uh, you know, Delhi Federation. I think that's Ashok uh, Vihar. Uh, you said Ashok Vihar. Ashok Vihar. So maybe that's uh, specific <laughs> to that area. So I'd like to uh, yes, seek your opinion. Uh, about responsibility. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know about that. Okay, but you know, it's responsibility of science first. So in a sense that, in my opinion, we completely disconnected urbanization and health everywhere in the world. So I work at Institut Pasteur. Institut Pasteur, Pasteur was the first one created vaccine. So before that, we were dealing with urbanization, and sorry, through, uh, with health through urbanization. We were preventing people from being, um, let's say, infected by, by a disease, by cholera and all. With, vaccination. We think that as individuals we can protect ourselves. So we lost really the link between urbanization and sanitation. Even now if you talk of sanitation, you're only talking about water access or defecation and all. No, sanitation is much more than that. Sanitation is to put the health at the center of urban developments, to prevent disease from spreading. You can create a vaccine for dinghy, but as I said, if you uh, eradicate, uh, let's hopefully dinghy, another disease will take place. So we really need to put this health at the center. This is true in India, this is true in Europe, much more actually. We completely lost uh, actually the way we were dealing with uh, disease control. This, is, this has to be put back. Science as well, I work myself 
at uh, many center, research centers and all, and where we were talking about sanitation, it was only about water access. No, it's much more than that. Actually, most of the points, most of the points that are being raised by all of us here are valid. One important point that becomes very evident from Olivier's talk is that as we scientists believed in the past, we had solution to all the problems. We identify a molecule, we demonstrate that in the animal model that this works as a vaccine, or we identify a candidate drug and prove that it works, and it has been successful in early years. Today, the problem of health is not singularly with individual molecules but it is a multivariate problem and what he identified is geographical issues but he is not denying nor will I deny that the variables are too many and one has to make a complex model and one of the reason why uh, those who are trying to manage these problems are not succeeding because we are not taking into account all the parameters and that is why I gave you example of weather forecasting. What was done several years ago and what is being done now there is a huge improvement and I am sure with newer methodologies in artificial intelligence in uh, abilities to generate data in a more accurate way. One of the important factors, let me tell you, the surveillance data can also be inaccurate because half the time our workers may not even go to the site. Ironically, Mathematics has solutions to that problem also. Even some of the accurate inaccuracies can be handled by simply mathematically modeling it. So it is a multivariate problem and that is what the recognition comes from analyzing data like this is what I believe. Anybody else? Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Manish Agarwal. I work with the Quality Council of India, QCI. Uh, so as we are discussing this issue of uh, emerging infectious diseases in the context of urbanization and global warming, and uh, you are a geographer, so I mean I want to ask like uh, it has been said that it is a complicated and tr tricky uh, issue and it is difficult to I mean there are so many uh, infinite number of variables which have to be studied at the same time to come to some conclusion so uh, I wanted to know whether like uh, is there any difference uh, 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 between developed countries and developing countries since you have studied this issue in uh, so many different geographies and urban uh, locations, uh, urban uh, agglomerations uh, uh, across the world, uh, Rio and Paris and India and uh, Thailand. So uh, does it matter like uh, if we are in a developing country or a developed country and from even uh, city to city within India or uh, uh, Europe and uh, USA, uh, America uh, or uh, South America or Africa, does it uh, matter like uh, the pathogens and how the pathogens and the West of one diseases they uh, uh, spread uh, uh, across uh, different geographies. Yeah, so. Yeah, thank you. No, actually, it's, it's quite tricky to answer this question because Europe and France has no dengue epidemics, for example. So I think India on that has an advantage that you are dealing with this diseases from long time. So clearly, France has a lot to learn about that, how to how this disease spread, etc. That's why I'm in India because dengue is not there. It's not due to sanitation. For me, it's only climatic factors. The other way, how we are studying these diseases everywhere, uh, I would say it does not change. We are all facing the emerging diseases everywhere in the world. It's just different diseases. So we have uh, flu in France. We try to model all the factors all together. This is very tricky. No one really succeeded. Uh, for Ebola, is the same thing. You know, they try to model the Ebola diffusion uh, everywhere. So Brazil is facing as well lots of epidemics. So no, we are all, I would say, in the same same, same world, you know, so it's different countries, but we are all facing these things. So we all should, you know, tackle this disease globally. Uh, and I think it's not being done yet. So we talk a lot about global warming. So just to talk about different things, we are talking about climate change, urbanization, but I think disease can link people and 
cities and countries all together and at the very short term because we are talking about climate change on long terms france will face these uh, these dinghy epidemics very soon and it should be you know by, by le learning what has happened in india it should help france to prevent uh, this disease to spread in uh, in france so to answer your question no i don't think countries other countries are doing better singapore is facing as well a lot of dinghy epidemic despite the fact that it's a completely different countries they have you know a huge sanitation program they can as well feed people if they are not managing their environment and they are still facing epidemics so of course we are tr all trying we are all trying to study the complexity of this disease diffusion it's interesting it's true but what i said before is that we should see as well beside beyond complexity what matters and in my opinion that's when socio-economical disparities matters if you help preventing this disease to spread in the most deprived area in winters it can have an impact on uh, disease diffusion uh, when epidemics emerge so so no yeah. i don't have a really clear answer but yeah we are f all facing these things no countries in doing better than the other ones and uh, that, that's it thank you so much thank you Actually, uh, Dr. Rupal is very strict on time. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you maybe we can have uh, one uh, question from a lady last. Yes, mm -hmm. no, let's also. If yeah, yeah, yeah. Brief, brief. Uh, mm -hmm. No, actually, it does not matter. I think we can deal with aggregated data. Individual data will be even too big for us to handle with it. So, let, let, let him, let him. so aggregated data is enough. If we have, you know, I showed a grid, 250 meters by 250 meters is more than enough. We don't know to go deeper than that to see regularities. But this question of anonymization, we're not even sure that we cannot track back individual mobilities with this data. So it has to be really studied before we unlink with this data. And I don't think it has been done, but this is a crucial question indeed. Yeah, please. So uh, actually, uh, thanks for your uh, nice presentation. Your uh, presentation is related to Delhi, but I'm talking about uh, dengue cases in other parts of the country. And uh, is there any underreporting of dengue cases, particularly in West Bengal? So some uh, health department is banning uh, writing the dengue in the prescription, in the diagnosis. So, do you see that underreporting of dengue cases? Uh, yeah, definitely, there is underreporting. However, you know, the quality of a surveillance system is not to catch 100% of cases. What we want is the surveillance system that enable to make it, to understand the trend of the disease and the geography of the disease. So, you know, trying to get 100% of cases is not the good way to do. It's cost too much money, but having a uh, fairly enough good surveillance system to understand the trend is important and ge geographical one, uh, you know, to, to understand how the, the disease spreads. So we need, for example, 38 Sentinel Hospital well de developed in the city, geographically well spread. It. For me, it's more important than trying to catch all the cases. But the difference, uh, difference between Delhi and other parts of the country is more for Delhi having extraordinarily good surveillance system and other factors may not be as important. Yeah. Oh. No, no changes at all. It's not possible. You know, we have this uh, beautiful doctors in France in 1910. He said that, okay, if you eradicate one disease, other will spread. So right now, I think what, how, how a change is to keep this disease diffusion low enough to, for hospital to handle the cases well. There is no way it's go we're going to be disease free. That's not possible. It's part of our evolution as well. You know, the genomes of human being has changed a lot according to malaria and it makes us what we are right now. So I don't even sure it's something good that could happen, but we have to help preventing important cases uh, for sure. So I think that is the last word, uh, and uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, I think that it's a good way of ending it, and it has been a fantastic discussion, and would you uh, 
appreciate i am very appreciative of the uh, active participation of the audience and uh, we had a, a, a really uh, great talk and great discussion and on my side thank you everybody Good evening to all. I may thank Professor Adel Marshall for recommending a wonderful speaker for the 19th STAP lecture. I thank you, Dr. Olivier Tell, on behalf of SEFIPRA and the STAP Lecture Forum for delivering this lecture. And if, thank you for demonstrating the linkages between the you know, climate change and the vector borne diseases, which is very, very relevant to our city our, and uh, this you know, Delhi and the NCR. And thank you for that and for analyzing the you know, uh, tropical you know, climate impact on diseases and the sanitation issues of our city. And when we were discussing on the topic of this lecture, the first name, first name came to our mind is the name of Dr. Solanke. Thank you, sir, for chairing this lecture and uh, st Pleasure. steering these discussions uh, with the real issues of our city. And I, I should thank the you know, STIP uh, member institutions for making this lecture possible. Thank you very much for that. And uh, as I said, uh, there is no lecture without audience. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all for coming and uh, attending and uh, actively participating in this, you know, in this discussion. So, and you know, I, may, I, I should acknowledge the encouragement of our director, Sefipra, and my colleagues at the SEFIPRA for making this lecture very successful. And once again, I thank you all on behalf of SEFIPRA and the STIP Lecture Forum.